we begin our worship, we invite you to turn to number, page number 114 in your worship book. And also with you. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who, ma who made heaven and earth. The Lord's name be praised. God of grace and glory, in the beginning you brought light Night. from darkness, Godly. created the world, made us in your image, and set us on the way. Your way. Praise you. Hallelujah, Lord Most High. This would have been enough, but when we had lost the plot, you gave your word Whoa. to your chosen people, chosen people to show us the way. The way. And so we praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah, Lord Most High. This would have been enough. But you came among us in Jesus, Jesus. the Christ, Christ, who stretched out his arms to fulfill the way. The way. And so we praise you. Thank Hallelujah, Lord Most High. This would have been enough, but you sent your spirit Clearly. to cleanse us, to renew us, and to join us to the way. The way. So we praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah, Lord Most High. In this song, we encourage one another with promises. Of God speaks to us of God's unfailing strength and grace toward us. Please rise in body or in spirit and sing.
be seated. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. God, why won't you be God? Do your thing. Night and day we come before you. Set all this to right. Are you off fishing? The soil is saturated with blood. We struggle to remember all the names. Our eyes glaze as the consequences of rage flicker on across our feeds. Indigenous women go missing. The authorities are silent. Prisons brim with three strikes and you're out. Why genocidal despots retire with their wine cellars intact. Neighborly infrastructure has failed. We thirst for vengeance. Look at the nations and see. Be astonished, be astounded, for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. For I am rousing the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Dread and fearsome are they. Their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. Crisis, insurgency, conflict, civil war. We are far from beating our guns into rototillers. God, why won't you be God? Show us that you have a pulse. In the last 24 days, your image bearers have been struck down by national violence in Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Kenya, Burkina Faso, Iraq, Mexico, Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, Chad, South Sudan, Mali, Kashmir, Pakistan, Myanmar, Colombia, Ecuador, India, Turkey, 
the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Central African Republic, Mozambique, Thailand, Angola, and Egypt. The United States has murder capitals. We grasp our pride, our safety, our ideology, our land, our way. Be astounded, be ashamed, be something, O oh God of the cosmos. We've fashioned ourselves into foes. Alas, for you who get evil gain for your house, setting your nest on high to be safe from the reach of harm, you have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. The very stones will cry out from the wall and the plaster will respond from the woodwork. Alas, for you who make your neighbors drink pouring out your wrath until they are drunk in order to gaze on their nakedness, you will be sated with contempt instead of glory. Drink you yourself and stagger. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and shame will come upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. The destruction of the animals will terrify you because of the human bloodshed and violence to the earth, to cities and all who live in them. Woe to those who get rich off of the cheap labor of children. Woe to those who say more is more. Woe to those who aim to live like no one else. Woe to those who spill toxins in watersheds because no one is looking. Woe to those who justify the consequences of the bottom line. Woe to those who linger over the tabloids announcing other people's shame. Woe to those who tune in to the drunken squabbles of reality stars. Woe to those who turn away from floating debris of fast food, emaciated polar bears, fleeing children. Woe to those, woe to them, woe to us. We roared in your sanctuary about our needs, our desires, our safety, ours, ours, ours. Summon us beyond consumption into hope.
What use is an idol once its maker has shaped it? A cast image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in what has been made, though the product is only an idol that cannot speak. Alas for you who say to the wood, wake up. To the silent stone, rouse yourself. Can it teach? See, it is gold and silver plated, and there is no breath in it at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. O oh God, how long will we forget your name? We believe this investment plan will give us a hope and a future. We believe this screen will soothe us. We believe in likes and followers. We believe in one nation to be our everything. In the power of squats, we believe in self-sufficiency. O oh Lord, we tried to recreate you in our image. Do not let us have our way. We said to ourselves, we believe in Jesus plus health. We believe in Jesus plus Amazon Prime two-day shipping. Jesus plus European ancestry. Jesus plus comfortability. We preach this in churches. Give us a vision. Let those watching hear and see your reply. God, why won't you be God? Let us be struck down by your glory.
friends, would you please join me in our prayer for illumination? Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds that we might hear and receive what you have to speak to us today. We pray this in the strong name of Christ Jesus. Amen. And now remember this portion of the story of God as it is written in the book that we love from Habakkuk 3 verses 17 through 19. Hear these words. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, Though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. <clears throat> Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, it's wonderful to be with you for the worship of God and wonderful to join hands with the marvelous team from Western Theological Seminary that has composed and has been enacting this wonderful service. Habakkuk is a short book and hard to spell, <laughs> except for its glorious ending, it's also pretty dark. Habakkuk is like a psalm of lament. It names one trouble after another and only in its last chapter modulates into a major key. Habakkuk prophesied in Judah, the southern kingdom that included Jerusalem and at a time when Judah was corrupt. The people were corrupt they were people of God, but they were violent people of God. They went at, e at each other's throats. They scorned God's law. Habakkuk says the law has become slack and justice never prevails. Justice never prevails. Bribery, theft, graft, thievery, all of it was rampant. Everybody had a hand in the till. or a thumb on the scale. And Habakkuk is appalled. He's appalled that people who have a God in heaven can't be honest under God. He also can't figure out why God puts up with all this mess. Habakkuk hates all the corruption and can't understand why God doesn't hate it too and want to do something about it. But then God somehow makes Habakkuk understand that God is going to do something about it Tell you what, says God, I'm going to raise up Babylon, or the Chaldeans who are reigning in Babylon, I'm going to raise up Babylon to punish Judah for her sins. And then in a remarkable sequence of verses, it's almost as if God celebrates the wildness of the Babylonians. God describes Babylon as that ruthless and dreaded people who are a law to themselves. They are terrifying in battle. Their horses are faster than leopards. Their horses are fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their soldiers are scofflaw warriors. 
guilty men, brawny and guilty men, whose own strength is their God. Habakkuk is appalled. A holy God will judge Judah by a nation even more corrupt than they are? Habakkuk swallows a couple of times, but he can't quite get this down. Habakkuk laments corruption in Judah and God's impending judgment on Judah, but then he thinks back on God's history with Israel, how God delivered Israel from the Egyptians and brought her people through the wilderness. God patiently led and fed an ungrateful nation for hundreds of years. God never abandoned God's people, even when they turned their backs on him. So even if God is going to judge Judah by the hand of the Babylonians, God will then judge the Babylonians and save Judah. But it's how God is going to save Judah that makes Habakkuk a little crazy. God's method is so dramatic, so apocalyptic, so extreme. When God goes out to save, says Habakkuk in chapter 3, when God goes out to save, God's hands shoot out solar rays. God pushes pestilence ahead and drags plague behind. God shatters the mountains and splits the earth with rivers, roaring rivers. God tramples the nations. God churns up the sea with trampling horses. God's salvation comes as uproar. And all this imagined shaking and quaking makes Habakkuk shake. He trembles, his lips buzz, his bones start to rot. He totters when he walks, all because terrible times are coming for the Judeans. The Babylonians are a ruthless and marauding nation. They will raid Judah's silos and butcher Judah's flocks. They will strip Judah's vineyards and trample Judah's fields. They will attack Judah's olive orchards that had been patiently tended for generations. All this is coming. And in pondering it, Habakkuk concludes his prophecy with a few verses so lyrical, so persistent, so full of faith that to hear them or read them is to be converted all over again. Terrible times are coming, but Habakkuk's faith rises to meet them. Though the fig tree does not blossom, and fruit is not on the vine. Though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no fruit, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in God my Savior. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Have we ever needed better evidence that faith in desperate times is God's gift? Terrible times are coming, yet I will rejoice. Everything I need will be stripped from me, yet I will rejoice. Habakkuk's faith is a sheer gift of God. He could never have worked it up on his own. He's been too busy shaking and quaking. His quivering muscles and his chattering teeth tell us that Habakkuk has had an encounter with the shattering presence of God. So interesting that as with Job, God explains nothing to Habakkuk. God just overwhelms him.
We sometimes think that, I would tell our children that meeting God would be pleasant, nice, warm, pleasant encounter with God. Meeting God would be like meeting Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Habakkuk discovers that meeting God is like getting electrocuted. Habakkuk's faith is a supernatural, God Almighty, Holy Ghost miracle. God gives Habakkuk faith, but not just faith. Joy, too, but not just joy. Exultation, too, but not just exultation. Strength, too. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. Habakkuk's tread has become light now. He can spring along the heights of the land. He can spring, he can leap, he can bound from peak to peak. He had been trembling, but now he's leaping. It's a glorious transformation, and only a pretty numb believer would fail to be touched by it. But there is something from a New Testament point of view that seems to be missing from the picture from the story of Job and of Habakkuk, we might get the impression that faith in troubled times comes only from encounter with the sheer, numinous power of God. God is the Almighty, and encounter with God is a fearful thing. And that's, of course, true as far as it goes. But what you long for is the story of God's love. God's power is in the service of God's love. God shatters, but only to mend and heal. And so listen to Romans 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or sorrow, or peril, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angel, angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul runs down the list of our enemies. Famine, hardship, nakedness, trouble, political tyranny. Here are the ugly realities from which every human being shrinks. Here are the things people fear so much that to avoid them they will trade in their spouse or their friend or themselves. Paul knew them all. Paul knew danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness. Scars from five floggings marked his back from neck to heel. He had been stoned, starved, shipwrecked. Paul endured a lifetime of the kind of suffering that if we endured it from even, for even one day, we would cry out from the pain of it. Trouble, hardship, danger. Shall these things separate us from the love of Christ? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Paul is our witness. Paul had a right to these words. And our claim to their truth depends on his witness. The validity of the great trumpet calls of the Christian faith depends on the witness of bruised saints, people who have done battle with evil, people who tell us of a sure hand on them in the battle, a loving hand that would not let them go. Some of us have so far met no greater danger than driving without our seatbelts. Hunger to us is just a busy schedule that delays our supper. 
we are more than conquerors? Really? Do the words fit? Can we claim them? It all depends on who's talking. They are Paul's words. And whether or not we have any right to them, he did. And so do so many of God's other wounded saints. And some of us here have a right to them too. Some of us have known real trouble and hardship. Some of us have known the demons Paul talks about, the demons that bring sickness and failure and fear that we're going to live on and on into littleness, becoming old and little and wholly dependent on others. We know, some of us, what it's like to have a son who comes home sullen, a son who is always looking for family money to buy drugs. Maybe some of us are battling trouble in our church home, and we have come to understand that there is no trouble more wearying and more depressing than trouble in the church. Shall these things separate us from the love of Christ? No. He will love us still. And there shall be some way provided by which we may meet the trouble that keeps coming. <clears throat> but let's be clear. We're not talking simply about gritting our teeth and gutting it out. Paul isn't saying anything as simple, as silly as that. Nor is he offering the sort of positive thinking that gets stuffed into some people so they have more of it than God ever intended anybody to have. I used to buckle when trouble came, but now I'm a giant. I'm a titan. Paul isn't recommending arrogance. The fact is that the world is a mess. A lot of heroes crack up. A lot of demons are on the prowl. Some of our pains seem to have no effective painkiller. If triumph over the powers of this age depends on us or on some phony mood we crank up, then the future is even darker than we ever dreamed on the rainiest Monday morning of our lives. So thanks be to God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel tells us that all hell has broken loose in this sorry world of ours and that all heaven has come to do battle. The gospel tells us that the main battle against sin and sorrow has, a, has already be, been fought and won and that Jesus Christ, the victor, has gone home from war. Meanwhile, the sober truth is that nobody knows what may still come by way of trouble or hardship, persecution, or the demons of this present age. Who knows what may come to us? Cancer, personal humiliation, maybe the loss of a job, God help us, the loss of a child. Could some of us be teetering on the brink of scandal caused by one of our addictions? We don't know. But we do know this. Jesus, the wounded conqueror, has mounted in triumph. He's opened a way for a whole new world in which there will be no more crying, no more sorrow, no more failure or littleness or loss. That is our future. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation shall separate us from the love of God 
which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Julian of Norwich was a medieval mystic who wondered a lot about why there had to be suffering in the world and why there had to be sin. She thought if only God had done God things and there wasn't sin, all would be well. And she had a near-death experience where she saw visions of Jesus, a suffering Jesus. And in those visions, Jesus said to her, this mystery, it was necessary for there to be sin. And yet, said Jesus in her visions, all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. Though the fig tree does not blossom and though there is no fruit on the vine, even so, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is my strength and my salvation. All will be well and all manner of things will be well. Would you please rise in body or spirit and claim this testimony and sing our testimony and our confidence. Let us lift our hearts in prayer. 
God of grace and glory, we are in awe of your redeeming work for us and for all creation. We know that in Christ, all will be well. We experience already the fulfillment of this promise, O oh God, in the crisp beauty of new fallen snow, in the contagious giggles of small children, in the arm around our shoulder when grief overwhelms our soul. We know that in Christ, all will be well. We experience already the fulfillment of this promise, O oh God, in the reconciliation of church members bitterly or even not so bitterly estranged, in the collaboration of congregations to manage a produce co-op, in attending a worship conference where strangers become friends. We experience already the fulfillment of this promise, O oh God, in the renewal of a brownfield to an open air market, in the dignifying presence of educators to prisoners, in a whole community rallying to resist a local epidemic, whether it's opioids, human trafficking, wage theft, or homelessness. We know that in Christ all will be well. And still, until Christ comes to resolve all our troubles, we long, oh how we long for the fulfillment of that promise, O oh God. When news feeds recount the capricious activities of national leaders in the North and the South, the East and the West, when headlines report again the thousand thousands around the world fleeing the violence of war or gangs in countries they would call home. When front page pictures show people huddled on a sidewalk tearfully consoling one another because shots were fired in a school, in a village plaza, or in a house of prayer. We long for the fulfillment of that promise, O oh God, when we experience exclusion rather than inclusion in worshiping communities. When we see a church building tagged with hateful words, when history and confessions keep us from sharing Christ's feast in one another's churches. We know that in Christ all will be well. We long for the fulfillment of that promise, O oh God, when we regret an angry email we've sent or received a belligerent text, when a loved one's memory is deserted to dementia or body to cancer, when life and love for us feel barren. We know that in Christ all will be well. Though the fig tree does not blossom, or a dream for our life must be deferred, though the produce of the olive fails, or thousands of paychecks are withheld, though the flock is cut off from the fold, or a declining church shuts its doors, yet we will rejoice in you, O oh God. We will exhort in you, the God of our salvation. We know that in Christ all will be well. In Christ in whom is all our hope and in whose strong name we pray. Amen. I am utterly convinced that nothing, not one thing, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In the run-up to this extraordinary realization, 
Paul breaks forth in wonder over this, that all who have been baptized into Christ, all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. And if by baptism we share his death, then just as surely by baptism we share his life. And if we share in his life, we share in God's love as children of God. So friends, exult. Exult not only in the sure knowledge that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus, but remember and exult also in our baptism into Christ. Remember and exult also in this indelible watermark by which God in Christ by the Spirit manifests to us, shows to us, as Paul says elsewhere, that we belong to Christ just as Christ belongs to God. As we sing, when you, meaning you plural, you all, you as one, receive these waters, when you receive these waters, remember and exult.
Would you rise, please? Jesus, the wounded conqueror, has mounted in triumph. He has opened a way for a whole new world in which there shall be no more death, no tears, no betrayal or failure or littleness or loss. That is our future. That's the testimony of the living word. That is the testimony of St. Paul, and it is the testimony we claim as our own as we sing together a song of mystery and victory. What wondrous love is this?
whatever your trouble. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit that you may abound in hope. Amen. Bless the Lord. You may be seated. The Lord's name be praised. Amen. Amen. My name is Kathy Smith, and I'd like to welcome all of you here to this 32nd annual symposium on worship at Calvin. And I do that on behalf of the staff of the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship and the Center for Excellence in Preaching. We are so glad that you are all here, and we look forward to a wonderful time of learning and worshiping together as we have begun already this morning. Throughout the next three days, you may meet over 1,400 people. <laughs> and some of them, many of them, almost half of you are here for the first time. How many of you are here for the first time? Amazing, that's wonderful. And if someone next to you raised their hand and you didn't, would you make sure they find their way around a little bit, at least this morning? Help them out, right? Um, we have about three to 400 students from high schools, colleges, seminaries, universities. Who are the students here? Thank you for coming. We look forward to learning along with you. And then we have over 100 guests from 30 different countries outside of North America, and they have traveled long and far, and I'd actually like to ask those who are present in this service to stand so we can recognize you. Outside North America. We all represent so many different parts of the Christian church, so many different denominations, so many congregations, so many different roles in worship and beyond, and it's exciting. We always hear every year how much is learned from one another. So I would encourage you, when you're standing in a lunch line or walking along the sidewalk, being very careful for icy spots, make a new friend. Introduce yourself. Ask someone where they're from and what they've been learning today. Let's um, enjoy a hospitable atmosphere of learning together. One of the other big venues is the Covenant Fine Arts Center. You'll be there this evening for worship, but also through the next three days, please visit the exhibits there. There are many folks showing their wares and telling about their organizations. And you'll find information in your book that there are two free books that you can pick up, an ecumenical hymnal and a bilingual children's book. So do look for those. And then for today, the next thing on the schedule is your first Thursday seminar. It begins in a half an hour. You have plenty of time to get there. What we ask you to do is to travel first and then have your refreshments during this um, half hour conversation break. So in your book, starting on page 18, are the seminars and each one will give the location and tell you where you will find your break food and then actually your lunch location after the seminar as well. And then one last thing, these wonderful books that you have all look alike. And if you set yours down somewhere, we might not know that it's yours. So I would suggest taking out your pen and putting your name on the front and the back, or one or the other. And then if you do set it down and we find it, we'll save it for you at the registration desk. Okay? Hope you have a wonderful day. Watch your step, but go in peace. <laughs> <laughs> 